Well, welcome to our review of Lesson 7, The King's Dream of the Great Tree, which concludes our study of Chapter 4 of Daniel. And we say hello to all of us who are joining us online. That's a big hello from us in the day class. We're really glad you're joining us. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for you are almighty God. And Lord, we are learning so much from Daniel that you desire for all mankind to see that you alone rule in the affairs of man. You alone are in control. You alone lift up kingdoms and bring them down. And we give you glory for your ways are wise. Teach us from your word as we study and wrap up chapter 4 of Daniel. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now in Lesson 6, Nebuchadnezzar began his testimony, and he recalled his dream of the the great tree. Now in Lesson 7, which is this week's lesson, Nebuchadnezzar recalls the meaning given to him by Daniel, which includes some very bad news for him. Let's begin by observing Daniel's reaction to what the king had just told him. I think we got a phone that needs to get shut down. Well, let's begin by observing Daniel's reaction to what the king had just told him. <clears throat> then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Daniel 4.19 Well, there's that word again, astonished. Again, which we saw in chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar first saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking about in the fiery furnace with one like the Son of God. The king was struck dumb with amazement then and was overwhelmed with what he saw. This is just how Daniel must have felt after he heard the king's dream of the great tree, and especially when he understood what it meant for the king. Many thoughts could have been running through Daniel's mind, such as, how will the king accept God's judgment, and how do I even tell the king what God has decreed for him? Daniel likely felt genuinely bad for the king, and probably was praying for God to help give the king this news. And as he sat there staring off into space, clearly troubled, the king encouraged Daniel to go ahead and give him the interpretation. You can almost hear and and picture the scene in your mind, can't you? The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Now, Daniel did what he always did. Daniel had courage, and he trusted the outcome to God. It's been around 25 years since Daniel first interpreted his image of a man dream in chapter 2. Daniel was now in his early 40s, and the king was in his late 50s, maybe early 60s. Daniel has undoubtedly developed respect and affection for Nebuchadnezzar through these years. Remember now, Daniel was ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all of the wise men of Babylon. We know that from Daniel 2.48. So Daniel would have spent considerable time advising and working for the king. During that time, trust would grow. And also remember, God's been working in Nebuchadnezzar's life, beginning there with a dream in chapter 2, all the way through the fiery furnace, and now to this last dream that he gave Nebuchadnezzar, the dream of the great tree. So we can see how God's been progressively working in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Back to the paper in the little box there. The king's dream was a decree of God, and the interpretation of it came from God as well. God gave the decree in a dream to the king, along with the interpretation of it to Daniel. And a decree attests that this dream will come to pass because it is the plan and purpose of Almighty God. As we read in Daniel 4.24, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which is come upon my Lord the king. Well, now we will learn exactly what this decree states will come to pass for King Nebuchadnezzar. 
Now, as Daniel gives Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of the dream, he begins by giving him the basic facts of the dreams, which are as follows. Nebuchadnezzar will be driven away from men. He will live with the beasts of the field. He will eat grass just like the oxen, and he will be wet with the dew of heaven. Basically, he's going to lose his sanity. He's going to be driven from the throne, live like an animal for seven times. He will be this way until God has humbled him to the point where he understands that God is in charge and not man. Until he knows that the Most High rules in the affairs of man and gives a kingdom to whosoever he desires, when he knows this, his kingdom will be given back to him. Now in the dream, remember one of the details of it. In the dream, the watcher and an holy one, that would remember those would be two angels. The watcher would be like the one in charge that came down with the other angel and they're to do something what God has given them to do. Well, in that dream, the watcher and the holy one left the stump of the roots of the tree and placed a band of iron and brass around it, and the dew of heaven will keep him alive. So that's what's keeping the stump alive. But the idea of the brass and the iron around it, that's, that's to prevent it from being chopped down. You know, if you have a band of iron and brass around that, but more than that, it is depicting and showing that God is protecting his kingdom. No one is going to destroy that kingdom or take it away. He's holding it there for Nebuchadnezzar until he has basically learned his lesson. This means the kingdom is protected from being taken over by someone else until Nebuchadnezzar has learned that the God of heaven rules. Well, it's important to note here that history did not record the king's madness. And while the Babylonians normally kept good records, especially of their accomplishments, we wouldn't expect them to record something so embarrassing for both Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. However, it's important to note that there are no historical records of his governmental activity between the seven-year period of 582 and 575 B.C., and that's something that several, a couple of commentators brought out at that point. And so when we focus on what God's judgment on Nebuchadnezzar, let's think a little bit about this madness that came upon him there in letter A. In the Jerusalem Post, dated July the 23rd of 2020, in the article, Could Archaeology and Modern Medicine Validate the Bible? Well, there is a reference to a modern-day example of someone behaving as an ox. Now, while we do not need to validate the Bible because we are assured of its truth, it's interesting to read that something similar has happened. In 1946, Dr. Raymond Harrison of England recorded his experiences of observing a modern-day case of boanthropy. Dr. Harrison observed that the patient's only physical abnormality was the lengthening of his hair and a thickened condition of the nails, the same anomalies that beset Nebuchadnezzar. Now, according to Meyer, who added that, like the famous king, the observed patient spent the entire day roaming the asylum grounds from dusk to dawn, eating handfuls of grass and drinking out of puddles, just like an animal. Now, a little more research on this will reveal that the, de the disease or mental disorder where someone believes they are an animal and acts like one is called zoanthropy. They may moo like a cow or bleat like a sheep. Who knew such a mental <laughs> conditions actually exist? Uh, lycanthropy is a form of insanity where the person believes they are a wolf, so they act like a wolf. And a similar disorder is cunanthropy, where the person believes they are a dog, so they act like a dog. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's illness caused him to act like an ox, so he would be labeled as having boanthropy. Well, now, I know this is on all our minds because you can't help but wonder, well, what was life really like for Nebuchadnezzar during, during this period of time? You know, questions come up, how was he treated? How could he even survive that? You know, we know God can do anything, but we, we just want to understand. So now let's consider how Nebuchadnezzar probably lived and was cared for during this period of time. First, how would the king avoid assassination to take his throne? 
Well, in ancient Middle East, the ravings of the mentally ill were sometimes thought to be inspired by the divine. So it was considered bad luck. Now, this is from a pagan point of view. It would be considered bad luck to kill someone who was mentally ill. So this custom would provide protection for the king. And furthermore, we know God had promised to preserve his kingdom. Consider why David present, pre, pretended to be mentally ill while he was among the Philistines. Just think back. It's in 1 Samuel 21, 10 to 15. David wasn't king yet, and he was on the run. He was fleeing from King Saul out of fear, and he ended up fleeing into the land of the Philistines. Now, servants of king, the, the king of Gath found him and took him to the king. Well, the king saw David was pretending to be mad and made himself disheveled and said he even had spittle running out of his mouth, everything to make him look mad. And so the king sent him away. He said, get this madman out of my presence. So that David fleed and got out of that land. Just an example of somebody else that had pretended madness to help them knowing that he wouldn't be harmed because they thought he was mentally ill. Well, now let's consider some other things about his life during this time of judgment that he was under. The king would be with the beasts of the field, but he would not be one of them. He may resemble an animal, but he is not an actual animal. Now, we can't help but wonder how any human could live for seven years or seven times by just eating grass. In Harry Baltimore's commentary, he makes the following observations. The question has been asked how the man could possibly have lived a life like that for seven years without perishing. In answer to this, we mention the following. The king had been used to the privations of the life of a soldier for 40 years. This means that when he was on his military campaign, see, he didn't have it easy. He may have had to live off the land, so he was, he was used to situations similar to that. According to the experts, the body of an insane person can sometimes endure a lot of abuse. And we need not to assume he had nothing to eat but grass and had no covering whatsoever against the elements. The word grass means, according to Vanderpalm, all kinds of raw foods such as roots and the wild fruits that grow in the fields or on the woods. Now, one thing that we can be assured of when you look at what grass is, that would be all the grains. That would be the wheat, the maize, which is sweet corn, rice, barley, oats, rye, millet, uh, fibrous roots, bamboo, sugar cane. There's, there's numerous plants in the, uh, um, in the grass family. So, I th so he would have had a greater variety of food than it's not just the green grass that you and I are used to. And first of all, we must see this as a miracle of God. And a miracle by the hand of God can, can nor needs to be explained. And this is interesting about this man, Harriet Bultima. He was actually a, a Dutch rightly dividing pastor, and I guess he was a very prolific writer, and then he ended up moving over here to the United States. I just thought that was interesting about him. Um, and we also wonder, how could the king suffer from his insanity of thinking he was an ox and yet still have the mental capacity to, capacity to acknowledge the sovereignty of God? Again, Harry Bultima addresses this in his commentary on Daniel. And I'm sure you, you all wonder that. You know, it's, well, how, would he, how would he perceive what he was living in around and how would that draw him to seeing that God is sovereign? You know, you, you would wonder that. Well, the answer to this kind of insanity, this kind of insanity brings an outward degradation. So his body on the outside, he looked like an animal, and he looked like somebody that was insane. You know, we, we've already heard that the, the feathers like an eagle, and his, his nails, and his long hair, and he would be very unkempt because he'd be living out there in the grounds with the animals. But there remains an inner self-consciousness, or as it would be called today, a sound subconsciousness. From the rest of the story, it can be deduced that the symptoms of this illness slowly disappeared again 
and that before long his complete restoration, Nebuchadnezzar could think clearly again. To me, what this is saying, he outwardly looked like an animal. He was behaving like an animal. He was living with them. But deep inside his mind, there was a part of him that was still there. And there was a part of him that God was allowing to be conscious and aware enough so that he could process what was going on in his heart and in his mind with his circumstances. And that would show and reveal the truths to him that God wanted to have him to understand. And that as time went on, he would be given enough awareness in his mind that he would see these truths. That's, to me, that's really what that's telling us. Now, next... How was Nebuchadnezzar treated during this period of time? Where was he at? Did they lock him up in a room? Did they take him out to some wooded areas and just let him go and say, go for it, live off the grass, we hope you learn your lesson? Well, no, Nebuchadnezzar was not confined, but was most likely allowed to roam the palace grounds. And remember, those would be a large ground. For all we know, they could have had an area sectioned off where they grew some grains, some foods that, that the royalty would need. Um, in fact, many think that's kind of likely. And loyal subjects such as Daniel would have watched over him, and they would have kept these onlookers for seeing the king in this condition. Undoubtedly, his counselors and lords understood the king's condition was temporary. They probably had been told about the king's dream and God's judgment. So when the king's heart had been changed, they were eager to welcome him back. It wasn't like they were shocked by it. They, were, they welcomed him, and they, when God returned all of his support system to him, they were eager to take him back. Uh, and it was his son, Evil Murodoc, who reigned as regent in his place during this time. And just have to mention this, because if you're like me, you would have thought, my goodness, that guy must have really been bad if they actually called him evil. But Evil Murdoch is not a name given because he was e evil, but it is the Hebrew translation of his Babylonian name, Amal Marduk, which means man of Marduk. Well, now this judgment of, upon Nebuchadnezzar will last seven times. Well, does times mean days? Does it mean months? Does it mean seasons? Or does it mean years? Well, one of the best and clearest explanations that I could find was in the New Unger's Bible Dictionary, so I just quoted it here for us. Uh, the Aramaic word for time is Aiden and appears in Daniel 4, 16, 23, 25, and 32. Iden means a set period. It is the definition of this word that has been much disputed. And in this passage of Daniel, the Gazaeus, which is a lexicon, gives this meaning as prophetic language for a year. Further support is found in Daniel 4.29, where there is a time period of 12 months, which Josephus, and we realize that Josephus is a respected Jewish historian, along with other ancient and recent Bible interpreters, which is another word for commentators, used to claim the Aramaic word Iden as being a one-year period of time. Now, the word Iden means a definite period of time, so it has a definite start and a definite end. But again, it's depending upon the context, the length of time may vary. This, again, is what causes the dispute in this passage. Now, commentaries written by Joel Fink, Harry Boltman, J. Vernon McKee, Karen Larkin, and some other Bible commentators agree the period is seven times is seven years. Now, some of them kind of hedge on uh, it being a year. They say they, they believe it is. I mean, they don't all define, you know, say it is. They might kind of hedge a little bit, but they generally seem to agree that it's most likely a year. However, there is a possibility that times could be months or seasons, making it a shorter period of time. And so when you think about it in the big picture, does it really matter if it was seven days, seven weeks, seven months, three and a half years, if you do seasons or seven years? What's really important is not the length of time, but what happened during that period of time. So now Daniel ends his interpretation with some counsel for the king. 
Daniel is hopeful that if the king would change his ways, perhaps God would have mercy and delay his judgment. So he advises the king to stop his sinful ways and start living a righteous life. The king can begin by showing mercy to the poor. This is what Daniel meant when he spoke to the king about a lengthening of thy tranquility. Daniel's trying to help the king avoid this immediate judgment revealed in his dream. Now, it's possible that Daniel had read in Jeremiah how God could withdraw judgment from a nation if that nation turned away from doing evil. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent, meaning God will change his mind, of the evil that I have thought to do unto them. That's in Jeremiah 18, 7 to 8. Daniel was applying this principle to Nebuchadnezzar's situation by giving him that counsel. Well, now we know that Nebuchadnezzar's problem was the pride that was in his heart. Remember way back in the, in the very first dream of the statue of the image of a man, God mentioned in there and to reveal the condition of your heart. So that was the, kind of like the beginning of this process. So before we consider when God's judgment fell upon him and the outcome, let's first, let's just take a break here and look into pride and what God thinks about it. Now, what way was, was Nebuchadnezzar prideful? Well, he took all the credit for the beauty of Babylon and even went so far as to say it was to honor his majesty. That tells you right there what his opinion was of himself. He'd elevated himself to deserving majesty. He did not give glory to God, but took all the credit for himself. Nebuchadnezzar saw himself as someone very special who was puffed up and wanted everyone to know just how great he was. Archaeologists have uncovered some inscriptions Nebuchadnezzar wrote, and on one of them it says, Then built I the palace, the seat of my royalty, the, the bond of the race of men, the dwelling of joy and rejoicing in Babylon, my dear city, which I love with the palace the house of wonder of the people, the bond of the land and the brilliant place, devote, or where there is majesty, devoid of majesty in Babylon. Basically, his palace is the seat of majesty. Now, the pride in Nebuchadnezzar became more obvious following the first dream God gave in chapter 2, the image of a man. Remember, we start off with the head of gold, then we have the chest and arms of silver, and then we have the belly and thigh of brass, then we go down into the legs of iron, and then going down into his feet of iron and clay. Well, this image showed all the Gentile kingdoms of the world with various metals for different parts of the body. Now, God told Nebuchadnezzar that he was the head of gold, and his kingdom of Babylon was the first kingdom. Years later, he built a golden statue of a man and demanded all the leaders in his kingdom to bow down before it. He had taken the fact that he was the head of gold, which was the first and best kingdom, and had exaggerated it to mean that he deserved to be worshipped. God looked into his heart, and he saw the pride that was in it. This is what God says about pride. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination, an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Proverbs 16, 5. Pride goeth before destruction. So pride proceeds destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18. So we can see God's view on pride, and we can also see that God doesn't overlook pride. And we're also aware that pride is an opportunity for Satan to exploit that pride within us, and it's a snare to us. I think that's one reason why God hates pride so much, because he realizes what a snare it is to us. Now, back to Nebuchadnezzar and, ju and God's judgment upon him. Now, God extended grace to King Nebuchadnezzar for 12 months, but Nebuchadnezzar didn't change. 
Did the king think he had gotten away with his prideful ways since nothing had happened to him? After all, 12 months had passed from the time he had received this dream from God about the great tree and life was just going on as normal. As far as he could tell, everything was okie dokie. Perhaps God had changed his mind or forgot. He could have been thinking that. Isn't it just like today? Many people think they too have gotten away with it because judgment is not passed on them. But God is slow because he extends grace, desiring that we change. Yet we will all give an account of ourselves to God one day. God does not forget and God does not overlook pride. Now, just as the king was bragging, you can almost picture this scene, can't you? Can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar walking around in, in beautiful Babylon? And just as the king was bragging about all the great things that he had done again for the honor of my majesty, a voice from heaven told him that he had just lost his kingdom, that judgment was swift, and all he had was told in his dream of the great tree happened within the same hour. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember all the things that we learned was going to happen to him in this dream. He'd act like an animal and eat grass and all that. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And that was in Daniel 4, 28 to 30. So then the judgment fell upon Nebuchadnezzar, just as it was described in the dream. Now, after seven times had passed, Nebuchadnezzar learned the lesson God had given to him, and now God's going to restore him and the, this, his kingdom to him. So his insanity was now gone because God had restored his understanding, and Nebuchadnezzar looked up to heaven with gratitude and worship. This placed within him a desire to bless God and to praise him. And at the, the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Wasn't that a beautiful, wouldn't that just be a beautiful picture if you could actually observe that and see this proud Babylonian king who had been through the humbling process that he was and that he finally got it, he finally saw it. Now, as a result of God's judgment upon him, Nebuchadnezzar had come to understand it in his mind and know in his heart that the God of heaven is God over the affairs of man. He knew that God's rule was everlasting from generation to generation. God is in complete control and he answers to no one. Nebuchadnezzar had learned these things about God. God is in complete control among those in heaven and those in earth. No one can question what he does. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Daniel 4.35 No one can stop him if he takes something away. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who, who will say unto him, what doest thou? Job 9.12 3. No one gives direction or teaches the Spirit of the Lord. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, has taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. That's out of Isaiah 40, 13 to 15. And finally, we have no business arguing with God over what he does in our life. He made us. We didn't make him. 
It is up to him how he fashions us into the woman that he wants us to be. We seek to obey his will. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the pot sherd strive with the pot sherd of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work? He, he hath no hands. Again, Isaiah 45, 9. Well, we know that God restored Nebuchadnezzar, a king of Babylon, and his counselors and lords were returned to him. And God added majesty to Nebuchadnezzar because he had come to know the living and true God. And he closed his testimony with the following. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol. And extol means to keep praising and praising and praising. It's like you're praising so much you can't stop. And honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. And I, Nebuchadnezzar would understand that, because that means to humble, Daniel 4.37. And I'm sure all of us have our own thoughts and, and opinions on, will we see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven or not? You know, to what extent did he really honor God? Did that carry on to the rest of his life? Did he merely see Daniel's God as a great God, but he still honored the other gods? Scripture's really silent on that. We can just go by what we have studied and seen through these chapters of Daniel and the progression that we've seen in, in Nebuchadnezzar's understanding and the proclamations that he has made. And, and we can hope that that did, was true and carried on. He didn't live that long, that many years after he made this proclamation. Some commentators say he only lived a year. Some say he lived six or seven. There just isn't much recorded about him during that, that period of time. So that's something that only obviously God knows, and, and we hope that he carried that over. But from what we can see here, I would say he looked like a man who had come to know the true God. That's what I would say, but we don't know what happened afterwards, and we're just going to have to rejoice in what we see, because that does give some hope. Well, now, our time spent getting to know King Nebuchadnezzar, second of Babylon, and our learning how God worked in his life has come to a close. Before we leave this time in history, here are a few facts about this man who was the head of gold. He was born in 630 B.C. and died in 562 B.C. at 68 years of age. His reign lasted 43 years, which was a long time, especially back in those days. It went from 605 B.C. to 562 B.C. He was the eldest son and successor of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the founder of the Chaldean Empire. He was a brilliant general. His name, Nebuchadnezzar, means Nabu, watch over my heir. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was a brilliant general himself, best known for his victory at Carchemish in 605 B.C. over the Egyptians. That was a huge military campaign and victory. And it was just a few weeks after this victory that his father died of natural causes. So he returned to Babylon to be crowned king as a war hero. Now, just think back when we first got started. Remember? Uh, Daniel and some, some other captives and, and uh, the golden vessels from the temple were taken by Nebuchadnezzar back to Babylon. Remember, he was in a real hurry, so he took the short route. Instead of going the long way, which is 900 miles, he took the short way, which is 500 miles, because he was in a hurry to get back and be crowned king. And on his way back, he stopped by Jerusalem, and then he went and took those vessels golden vessels from the temple, and he took some of the choice captives, which included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and a few other of the royalty, because it was a common practice back then for kings uh, to want to come back with some bounty from where what they had captured, and it would bode him well if when he came back to Babylon to be crowned king, not only was he a war hero from his military victory over the Egyptians, but he actually was bringing something back with him. And so he knew that would really make him popular. So that was important to him. Now back to our paper here. History records he had one wife and one marriage, and that amazed me when I saw that. I expect he would have had all kinds of wives and concubines and, and, and everything, but 
He, it records he has one wife and one marriage. He had six known th sons and three known daughters. His wife was Amatus of Media, and she died in 565 B.C., just three years before Nebuchadnezzar died. History claims he built the Hanging Gardens. Remember, they were one of the seven wonders of the world to make his wife happy because she missed the green mountains of her home in Media. Well, ladies, next week we're going to study Chapter 5, and we're going to study the writing on the wall. So that's going to be fun. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the life of Daniel and for Nebuchadnezzar and all the truths that you can teach us from, from looking at their lives and seeing how you worked in them, seeing how Daniel is so faithful and true, and seeing how Nebuchadnezzar responded to the dreams and the visions that you gave him, Lord. Um, we, we thank you for your word. We know it is truth. May we honor you with our lives this week. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.